Good morning, church family. If we have any visitors today, welcome to the Southern Cross. Last Sunday, in our study of Acts, chapter 26, Paul stood before King Agrippa and Governor Festus. He took the opportunity, once again, to share the gospel message along with his personal testimony. By the end of the chapter, preparations were being made to send Paul to Rome, where he is now scheduled to stand trial before the emperor. So now, let's get ready to pick up our study in chapter 27. If you'd like to follow along in the reading, but you don't have a Bible of your own, you're welcome to grab one of ours off the table behind you. And now, here's Pastor Frank. Good morning. It's good to be here this morning. Appreciate everybody coming out to be with us. I enjoyed the worship service this morning. God is good. He's blessed us today. If we woke up with breath and we're here today, we're blessed. Let's open our Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 27. If you're using a church Bible, that would be page 1168. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning before we begin. Heavenly Father, thank you today for this blessing of being able to gather here in this building, Father. Thank you for giving us another opportunity to come together around your word. And Lord, I pray that you would help us humble our hearts, that we might hear what the Spirit is saying to the church here in these last days. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So we pick it up in chapter 1 this morning of Acts chapter 27. In verse 1 it says, And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. Now what is a centurion of the Augustan cohort? The NLT version Bible renders that a captain of the imperial regiment. That's because... Well, if you think about what would be the significance of this particular cohort, and again, what's a cohort? These are military terms, I guess, from times further back. It's, it's a regiment, you know, it's a band of soldiers. And the significance can be seen in this because he's, it's named after Caesar Augustus. It's named after the emperor. And so today, I tried to think of something to compare it to, and all I could come up with was the Secret Service, because in that day... Uh, the Emperor Augustus had created a special forces and they were primarily um, tasked with just protecting the Emperor. That was their job, kind of like the Secret Service today and the President. So these were specially trained soldiers. So this was a centurion. It was the captain of a hundred of these guys. That's why he's called a centurion. It comes from the word century, which means a hundred. He's a captain of a hundred soldiers. And this captain was uh, given the duty to accompany Paul to Rome and protect him because you remember Paul's life has been under threat constantly from the Jews especially. And they want to make sure he makes it to Caesar. So they, they give him this, this uh, centurion to make sure he does. So in verse 2 it tells us, And embarking in a ship of Adramidium, Adramidium, that's just the name, of the port from where the ship came from, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. Well, that's a mouthful. Aristarchus, he's an early Christian. He's mentioned a few times in the New Testament. Uh, you'll see his name here and there. He was a companion of Paul's. Uh, and here, he if you notice, he's on the ship with Paul, and they're headed to Rome. Uh, Aristarchus has chosen, he's not, he's not a prisoner like Paul in the sense that he was charged with anything, but he's chosen of his own free will to go with Paul because he's a friend and he wants to be a companion to him on his trip to Rome. Of course, Luke is with him too, that's why we're reading this today. Luke wrote all of this as a personal witness. You know, I want to mention this, if I could, as a side note, um, well, in Colossians, the letter to the Colossians from Paul, Colossians 4.10, Paul writes, Aristarchus, my fellow, Aristarchus, I think I should pronounce it, my fellow prisoner greets you. 
So, you know, later Paul's writing from the prison to the church of Colossae, and he mentions Aristarchus here. And I want to read chapter 4, Colossians chapter 4, verse 10 and verse 11 and verse 14 from the New Living Translation right quick because I don't know if any of you have ever wondered about it, but Luke is said to be a Gentile by some scholars. Uh, others say he was a Jew, and some people just don't know. Like me, I just don't know one way or the other for sure because we don't have any concrete evidence one way or the other. But you probably have heard me say many times the Bible was written by Jews. You know, all the authors were Jewish. And that's true. We know that for sure, except when it comes to uh, Luke, the physician. The Bible refers to him as a doctor, a traveling companion of Paul's who wrote the book of Luke, who wrote the gospel who wrote, I'm sorry, who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And some people have surmised that he may have been a Gentile. And if he is, he would be the only Gentile writer of the Bible, which would be really interesting. But I found something, or I noticed something. I've read this before, but I noticed it a day or two ago. And it seems to be circumstantial evidence to me that Luke was a Gentile. I'll let you judge it for yourself, but... Here Paul is, he's, he's on a ship headed to Rome to face the emperor concerning these charges his Jewish brethren have made against him. He winds up being held there for a couple of years under house arrest, and during his time there in custody, he writes to different churches that he had started previously. And one of them was in Colossae, and so he writes a letter called Colossians, Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, 11, and 14, it says this, Aristarchus, who is in prison with me, sends you his greetings. And so does Mark, Barnabas' cousin. Jesus, the one we call Justice, and he's talking about, that was a common name among Jews. So he's talking about a, a Jewish person there named Jesus. Uh, also sends his greetings. These are the only Jewish believers among my co-workers. They are working with me here for the kingdom of God and what a comfort they have been. Luke, the beloved doctor, sends his greetings, and so does Demas. Now, y'all see what's going on there? See, somebody's shaking their head. Somebody's getting it. He, he mentions Luke. Luke is there with him. But before he says Luke's name, he mentions some Jews, and he says, these are the only Jewish believers with me. And then he goes on to mention Luke and Demas. Now that's some really strong evidence to me that, that Luke was a Gentile, that he wasn't a Jew, which would mean one of the writers of the New Testament was not a Jewish person. I'd never noticed anything or seen anything like that before. I've read all kinds of commentaries over the years from different scholars, and I'm baffled that none of them ever brought this passage up, or maybe I just didn't read the right one. Maybe somebody did. I thought that was something. Well, anyway, verse 3, back to the, the narrative here. In verse 3 it says, The next day we put in at Sidon. That is, they docked the ship at Sidon. There's a lot of sailor terminology here. Uh, and Julius, the centurion, treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends to be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. Now, now here, when it says we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us, the lee just means the shelter. That's another sailor term. Um, it just means they sailed in proximity to the, the island of Cyprus in such a way it kind of broke the wind that otherwise was causing them trouble. It's a nautical term. We'll encounter more of these as we go along. In verse 5 it says, And we had sailed across the open sea along the coast of Cilicia and Pamphylia. We came to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy, and he put us on board. Now they're, they're changing ships there uh, with the prisoners and some of the, uh, the people. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Nidus. Now the sea is silent. And as the wind did not allow us to go farther, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salon. 
Salmony. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lycia. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over. Okay, let's stop right here. In verse 9, Luke says a lot of time has passed. Sailing is now dangerous. Even the fast is over. What's he talking about? Well, the fast is uh, Yom Kippur. That's Hebrew for the Day of Atonement. It's the holiest day of the year in Judaism. And they fasted on that day. And uh, it occurred in the fall, in October to be specific. And of course, it's known that uh, right there in the Mediterranean Sea, that in October, in the fall, uh, sailing conditions are really bad. There's a lot of storms that whip up during that time. That's why Luke takes the time to point out to us that they got on board the Alexandrian ship, this Egyptian ship that moves really slow. And he says, it's, you know, suddenly now even the fast is over. They're having difficulty already. Looks like they've missed their window of opportunity for uh, fair weather sailing. It says, Paul advised them saying, Sirs, I perceive the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And because the harbor was not suitable to spend the winter in, the majority decided to put out to sea from there on the chance that somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete, facing both southwest and northwest, and spend the winter there. They didn't want to stop where they were, even though Paul was warning them. Uh, you might wonder, why would Paul be giving all this advice to all these professional sailors? You know, Paul's a preacher and a rabbi. But the thing is, according to the New Testament, Paul had been at sea many times. He tells us that he's been stranded at sea. He's been shipwrecked. He mentions that. So he has a lot of experience sailing in the Mediterranean waters. Verse 13, let's see. Verse 13 says, Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, that is some good weather now, they think, hey, this is our chance, they weighed anchor, that just means they pulled up the anchor, and sailed along creek close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. Notice in verse 14, Luke said this storm was called Northeaster. Now you know it's bad when a storm has its own name. We're familiar with that, aren't we? It, Luke said it got so bad that they could no longer resist it, that they were just driven along by it. Verse 16 says, Running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the ship's boat. Now the ship's boat, that's the lifeboat that hangs off the side of the ship, kind of like a dinghy. After hoisting it up, they used supports to undergird the ship. Now I don't know how they did that back then. I don't know what their method was. But they managed to get ropes or something under the ship and pull it around to the sides and kind of tighten it because they were worried about the ship coming apart. That had to be really tough, especially in a storm. They lowered the gear and thus they were driven along. That is, they lowered the anchors and let, let, they let them drag in the sand to slow them down. Verse 18 says, Since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. And on the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When he uses tackle here, it's just talking about everything. It's not nailed down, basically. We think of tackle like fishermen, you know, stuff that you fish with, but it wasn't really the case here. Uh, verse 20 says, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. At this stage, they feel that all hope is gone. And they, they seem to think they're as good as dead. Verse 21 says, Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Don't you just hate and I told you so? <laughs> Paul's letting them have it now. But Paul's had a revelation. Check out what he says in verse 22. 
You'll see why he's speaking the way he is. Verse 22, Paul says, Yet now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Now isn't that something? God says, You must stand before Caesar, Paul, so don't be afraid. In other words, you know, this is your destiny. This is your future. It's kind of like with us. You know, we're invincible until our duty is done here. Until that which God has called us to do, the plan that He has for our life, if we're living within that plan, we can feel like Paul felt right here in this moment. Because you notice, if you go back earlier here, uh, in verse 10, what was Paul saying before he heard from the angel of the Lord? In verse 10, Paul said, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. So you see, even Paul was scared for his life to begin with. He was warning them, don't set sail, this is too risky. But now suddenly his, his whole tone has changed. He's telling the men, you know, I told you so, you should have listened to me. But don't worry, I've seen an angel of the Lord, everything's going to be alright, because he told me my future, my destiny, I can't die at sea right now. I've got to stand before Caesar. And he told me he's going to give me y'all's life as well. In other words, y'all are not going to die either. It's going to be okay. Ain't nothing going to happen to you. Ain't nothing. That's, that's southern for the original Greek there. So he says in verse 25, So take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have told you. Paul says, but we must, we must run aground on some island. Now Paul, he's just taken over at this point, if you notice. He's like the new captain on board. He's telling them what they got to do, how they got to do it. He says, when the 14th night had come, as we were being driven across the Adriatic Sea, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took a sounding and found 20 fathoms. Soundings. Now that's, the sail that's what the sailors call it, you know, when they're measuring how deep the water is. Today we call it an echo sounding, you know, because we use a sonar pulse. It goes from the bottom of the ship, you know, and it bounces back and they can gauge the distance. A little farther on, they took a sounding again and found 15 fathoms. And fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. It sounds like Paul's even got them praying now. And as the sailors were seeking to escape from the ship and had lowered the ship's boat into the sea under the pretense of laying out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the ship's boat and let it go. Now that's something right there. They were trying to sneak off. Some of the soldiers were... <laughs> They were letting down the little lifeboat there. It says under the pretense that they were working with the anchors. They were pretending to work on something important and they were about to slip off. But once again, Paul's got a handle on things. I mean, notice he's telling them what to do. He's finding some men about to sneak off. And he tells them, unless these men stay, we can't, you, know, you guys can't be saved. In other words, this is an all or nothing deal. We all stay together and the Lord will uh, he'll help us come to shore safely. Paul knew if some of them abandoned ship, I mean, he couldn't, uh, what nothing that could be done. I mean, they'd be on their own. Verse 33 says, As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will give you strength, for not a hair is to perish from your head of any of you. And when he had said these things, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Now here it, it tells us that Paul prayed in front of everybody. You know, he didn't just kind of tip his hat and whisper a prayer. He said a prayer in front of all. Paul knows this is his opportunity to be a witness for Christ, and he was always looking for a chance to be a testimony, wasn't he? Everywhere he went. 
So now he's got them looking to him. They're feeling hopeful again. And they believe, you know, Paul really did see an angel and they're listening to him. And he's using this influence now to be a witness for the Lord. Did we stop on uh, 35? Verse 35. And when he said these things, he took bread, giving thanks to God. And, okay, I've read that. Uh, 36 says, Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. They were encouraged to see Paul eat, so they joined him. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. So Paul's got a captive audience of 276 people. And when they had eaten enough, they lightened the ship, throwing out the wheat into the sea. Now, when they had eaten all they wanted, then they threw the food overboard. Because they believed they were about to run aground and, you know, and be okay, but they wanted to eat one big meal before they threw everything overboard. Because they're trying to lighten the load, you know, make the ship nimble, make it light, because the waves and all, you know, can tear it apart more easily if it's weighed down and real heavy. But it'll toss easier if it's lighter. That's my take on it anyway. Now when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned, if possible, to run the ship ashore. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that tied the rudders. Then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, I assume that's a coral reef, they ran the vessel aground. The bow, that is the front, stuck and remained immovable, and the stern, that is the back, was being broken up by the surf. The surf, that's the wave. So Luke says the front end of the ship became stuck before they reached shore. It got stuck too soon. He was hoping to run aground closer to the shore. And then the, the violent crashing of the waves begins to break the ship up. It's crashing into the stern, it tells us, which is the back of the ship. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners. It tells us in verse 42, lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest on planks or on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. So you see, it's happened. What Paul told them has come true. At this point, you know, no doubt, one by one, they're floating in, they're swimming in, and then when the last one reaches the shore, you know, and crawls up onto the beach with the salt water dripping from his hair, they were all thinking, that Paul is a prophet. He knew what he was talking about. He told us if we stayed together, God was going to save us all. None of us would die. And here they are, all safely ashore. Of course, they're not out of the woods yet, you know, as we'll see in the next chapter of the book of Acts. It addresses, you know, what they go through there and uh, how they make it from there. But, you know, it tells us in verse 42 that the soldiers hatched a plan to kill the prisoners because, you know, even though they're feeling hopeful, Paul has them encouraged, their faith isn't perfect, you know. They, they don't necessarily believe 100% that it all may work out exactly like Paul has said. It's just that when you're desperate, you know, you take what you can get. So, you know, they're feeling encouraged and they're listening to Paul, but as soon as the ship gets stuck before it reaches the shore, all of a sudden they're in a panic. And the reason they are is because it's their job to deliver the prisoners. And if the prisoners escape, and they could have in any way kept them from escaping, you know, they will be in trouble. Some historians say that it was... Uh, it was it was the rule that if you lost a prisoner under your watch, that you would be put to death. Uh, a lot of historians actually say more accurately that whatever that sentence was for that prisoner you lost, you would have to take his sentence. If he was being sentenced to death, you were put to death. If he was just going to spend 20 years in prison, now you as the guard that let him go or escape, you would have to fulfill his 20-year sentence. So you can see why the guards were like, hey, these guys are going to get away now. They're fixing to jump. We're too close to shore. They're going to jump overboard and escape. Well, let's kill them. That's better than letting them escape. But if you notice, it said the centurion wishing to save Paul. Once again, saved by the centurion. He, he knew that if they killed these other prisoners, Paul was one of the prisoners. He would be killed also. So he saved him. In the New Testament, these centurions 
they're always depicted as men of integrity. I don't know if any of you noticed that. I think I've mentioned it a few times as we go along. We come across the different stories in these Roman centurions. They always seem to be men of good character. It's always amazing. Um, Levi, put that picture up there. I'm going to tell you about a couple of them. If you think about it, the centurion that declared at the cross, surely this was the Son of God, you know, that was a Roman centurion. There on the cross, the Bible tells us that they were mocking Jesus and they were hurling insults at Him and that the Jewish leaders who should have believed in Him had all reason to believe, you know. They were saying, you know, physician, heal yourself, come down from the cross if you really are the Son of God and all these kinds of things. And then the Bible tells us, you know, that Jesus cried out to the Father. And, you know, this chain of events were set in motion. And by the time it was over, it said that the Roman centurion looked and said, Surely this was the Son of God. You know, the, the writer of the Bible was careful to document that. That a Roman centurion at the cross acknowledged and became a believer right there on the spot. For it told us that right before the centurion said that, the Bible said, Jesus, you know, he gave up the ghost. He was in control of his own life and his own death. Because before the centurion said that, it said, Jesus, you know, he uttered his last words and he breathed his last. And he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. You know, he was in control of the moment he would die. For he had told him, he said, uh, no man takes my life. He said, but I'll lay my life down of myself and I can take it up again. He said, I have this commandment from my Father. And he did that. And the centurion noticed that. Then there was the centurion that asked Jesus to heal his servant, also showing good character, you know. He had a servant. He was concerned about him. And he sent and asked Jesus if he would heal his servant. And Jesus said, yes, I will come and heal your servant. And the centurion said, no, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof. He said, but rather, just say the word, and I believe he'll be healed. He said, for I'm a man also under authority, and I have authority over others. See, he was acknowledging, he knew Jesus was under God, the Father's authority, but Jesus had authority here on earth over everything. And he says, I'm a man like that. I'm under authority, and I have authority of others. And he says, I can say to one, go, and he goes, another come, and he comes. He said, just say the word. I know he'll be healed. And the Bible says that Jesus turned around and looked to those who were following him. And he said, I haven't found so great a faith in all of Israel. And I, that's never ceased to amaze me. Every time I read that, I think, what a phenomenal statement. All of Israel is supposed to be the people of God, the chosen people, the ones with the scriptures. And here was a Roman soldier, a centurion, who had enough sense and had enough respect in, de in decency that he recognized and he reverenced Christ, the Son of God, you know. And Jesus acknowledged him saying, I haven't found this kind of faith among any of you guys yet. He's got the strongest faith of all. And so he healed his, his uh, servant. And then you have the centurion named Cornelius, you remember. He turned out in the New Testament to be the very first Gentile saved. He's the first Gentile that became a Christian. You know, on the day of Pentecost, the church was born and, and uh, they were all coming to faith in large numbers. The Bible said on that day, 3,000 people were baptized in the name of Jesus and were saved. But then later on, Peter goes down and visits a centurion who had sent for him, named Cornelius. And he went down there and he preached a sermon and the Bible said while Peter was speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon the centurion and all of his household. And uh, some of them started speaking in tongues and prophesying. And it, it was a great revival broke out right there in the man's living room. And it said afterwards, you know, they were all baptized and they were converted. The first Gentile family to be converted to Christianity was under the direction of a Roman centurion. He was the man of the house. And then you have this centurion, you know, from the Augustus cohort. Here with Paul, uh, accompanying Paul companion to Paul, keeping him safe all the way to Rome. You remember before Paul ever got on the ship, um, it was a Roman soldier that rescued him when the Jews were about to tear him apart. You know, and Paul's giving a speech there in Jerusalem, 
and he mentioned how that God was sending him to the Gentiles and the Jews lost their mind, you know, because they hated the Gentiles. They were, if ever there was a racist group of folks in ancient times, they were. They hated Gentiles. And so when Paul said God had told him to, to share the gospel with the Gentiles, they went berserk and they just attacked Paul. A mob broke out, a lynch mob. And the Bible tells us it was a Roman soldier. I can't remember if it was a tribune or a, I think a tribune gave orders to one of his soldiers to rush in there and pull Paul out and rescue the man, you know, until they could find out what was wrong. Because you remember the, uh, the tribune said it's not our custom that a man should be found guilty before he has a chance to face his accusers and give a defense for himself. And I told you back then that that's basically our equivalence of innocent until proven guilty. You know, Rome had some good laws. They ruled by reason of law in that day. They had civilized much of the known world. Of course, similar to our history also, in the trail of things, Rome became very decadent eventually. Um, they became so powerful, so wealthy, and the people became so sinful that historians tell us that Rome was never really conquered from without by its enemies, but more so it was conquered from within you know, by its own decadence and its own sinful way of life. The civilization just began to crumble and collapse from within for lack of moral living and all the partying that was going on and the different things. And we see that today in America. Same thing, America reminds us of Rome. I've even read scholars who compared it to that. You know, America has become so powerful that our enemies are afraid to attack in a conventional war because most of them know they wouldn't really stand a chance. But they're standing by now watching as America is collapsing from within, from decadent living, from a lack of morality, people turning their backs on God, people partying, you know, just an abundance of sex and violence and, you know, all of these things where we're getting away from the principles that the nation was originally founded upon. So America, much like Rome today, is collapsing from within. And of course, with Rome, eventually it became so weakened under this condition that its enemies, kind of like vultures picking apart a corpse, picked Rome apart. And uh, that could very well be America's future. It would appear that things are shaping up that way. That it may not be too long in the future when America's enemies will begin to pick this country apart as they see America weakening. I believe some are watching very closely now, just looking and waiting for their opportunity. You've heard me say it before. I mean, I, I kind of keep up with uh, geopolitical stuff. I'm not big on watching local news, but I try to once in a while keep up with what's going on in the big picture. And I see the world posturing for war. That's what I see. I see people shoring up their allies and all, all the major nations have increased military spending, virtually all of them. And uh, it would seem that they're suddenly in a mad rush as they prepare for war. Something's going on, folks. And if ever there was a time to turn back to God, you know, even, even us, people who believe, people who go to church, people who try to serve the Lord, it's a reminder to us that each and every day we should repent of our sins along the way. You know, I've told you before, repentance is not just a one-time thing. There is such a thing as initial repentance where you come to the Lord and you ask Him for forgiveness of sin and because of the finished work of the cross, we get that. And He gives us a clean slate and we come into the family of God. And Paul said after that, I'm persuaded to believe that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing in this world or the world to come, neither life nor death, or nothing, Paul said, in all creation has the power to separate you from the love of God, which is in Christ. That's once we become born again. It can't be undone. But the Bible teaches we should, from that point on, live a life of repentance so that we can keep a clear conscience. Not because if we don't repent every day we might be lost, but because it keeps the conscience clear. And God can bless us and He can protect us and He can walk with us and He can give us the life that He would like to give us. He can take us and make us part of His great master plan in this world. You know, for I, I remind you that it was Jeremiah who made this statement, this prophetic utterance when he spoke for God and said, I know my plans I have for you, says the Lord. 
plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but plans to give you hope and a future. And any time we, you know, get discouraged and we get a little worried, things are going wrong and we get depressed, and we're having a series of problems, it's easy. You don't even have to try. It just comes natural to think, oh my, you know, what's going on? I, have I, do I have it wrong? I, was it not really like I thought? Maybe I'm not really saved. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe, you know, something's bad's happening. And we can get fearful and full of anxiety, but we should always go back to the foundation because I leave you this this morning as closing remarks. The Bible is our absolute. It's our foundation, and we need one. You know, without a foundation, we're in bad shape. You know, we're just left to intellectual reasoning, whatever some educated person says or some uneducated person might say. Whoever can talk the loudest out there seems to get the attention and the platform. You know, we're just left to a bunch of confusion by the talking heads. But if we believe in the Bible, we have a foundation. As they were talking here, we have an anchor. And just like when the storms arose, if you remember, what did they do? They let down the anchor so it could kind of hold them stable. See, and that's what we should do. When the storms of life arise, we let down the anchor, which is the Word of God. And what does the Word of God say? The Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans to prosper you, not to harm you, but to give you a future and a hope. Do you believe the Word of God this morning? Can we give Jesus a hand clap? Praise the Lord. The Celestia comes up this morning to send us off with a song. Let's just go to the Lord in prayer together. out to the Lord in our spirits. It's not a matter of the words we say. We don't have to speak in an elegant way or in some theological way. This morning I, I got on my knees before I came to church and I just got quiet and I had some music playing and suddenly I just felt like I could feel the Lord's presence. I suddenly felt a peace come over me. I don't get that as often as I used to because I've, I've got a lot going on the past few months. It's been tough. But I felt peace as the music played. I just tried to clear my mind. I could tell the Lord was trying to give me peace. So this morning, let the Lord give us peace. Let Him bless us. Father, we thank You today once again for this great opportunity that you woke us up today alive and well. And yeah, we may have problems, lots of circumstances that we just don't even know how to, to deal with. But Lord, I pray this morning that you would help us. You know our nature. You made us. Help us, Father, to let go. As the song says, let go and let God have his way. Father, we know this morning, according to Your Word, if we don't let go, if we're wrestling with circumstances, You can't help us. It's only when we let go that You can step in and do something for us. Help us to free fall by faith. To step off that ledge where we're hanging on to our own abilities and our own knowledge and our own finances and our own plans. Help us to step off that ledge self-preservation, Father, and free fall into faith, knowing that you'll catch us, Lord, and that you'll help us, and you'll get us through that which otherwise we cannot get through. Father, I pray that you would bless each and every person who came today. I pray that you would help us as we go out this week, facing our responsibilities and our jobs, and I pray, Lord, that you would watch over our little ones. Keep them safe, Father, as they run around and play sometimes out of our sight. I pray that your angels would leave with each family, Lord, that you would watch over us. Bring us all back together again next week, once again, 
as we gather around your great and glorious word. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. And everybody say, Amen. Thank you.